Hello everybody, this is Laura coming to you today from End Time Apostasy. I hope you guys are doing well. Now today we're going to look at another person that is on Doreen Virtue's channel. Um, what I'm just going to basically let you listen to some of this. This guy's name is Jeff Durbin and Jeff Durbin is a Calvinist. But I'm just going to let you listen to a, a small break or a small um, portion of this video and then I'm going to bring you over to show you who this man is and then I'm going to expose the guy. Okay, so we're going to do it like that. So let's play this. One more question. Sure. sure. No, I'm, I'm grateful. Thank you. And thank you for the blessing. So I'm asking this question reluctantly and I hope that you know that I have the greatest respect and love for you and your family and your ministry. But um, I'm um, and Melissa and I are both part of discernment ministry groups on Facebook. Mm -hmm. If this woman is a discernment minister, we're in big trouble, guys. She's all of like, it, she says she got saved in 2017. But here's the problem. You know, there's many false, um, many false converts out there and false prophets and false teachers. There's many people out there that think they're, they're Christian, but they're not. Now, the Calvinistic gospel teaches a different Jesus and a different gospel if you guys have not seen my first video um on or my second i should say on doreen virtue i would advise you to go back and have a look at it i specifically go into the calvinistic doctrine and show you how they teach false doctrine so if you haven't watched that one i i would advise you to go back and have a look at that okay so let's just keep playing this okay and so I'm only asking this to help, <laughs> okay? Sure. Because Melissa and I once did a video because there was a lot of rumors about me, and she she just took the rumors and just put them out there so that I could talk about it. So that's the spirit of what I'm about to ask you, okay? And you probably know what's coming up. Is that in, in a lot of the um, groups on Facebook, everyone's saying, well, we love Jeff Durbin, but... And then the, it, they, they point to Michael Brown and your relationship with him. Oh, so I just want to see if you could talk about that openly. Yeah. 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 So uh, Michael Brown is uh, is a friend. Um, we have uh, significant disagreements with Dr. Brown, uh, Pastor James White and myself and the other elders of Apologia Church in the area of uh, um, the sovereignty of God, predestination, reformed theology. We, we believe in the doctrines of grace. Okay. So now what I'm going to say to you, first of all, is this, brethren. Michael Brown is a heretic, okay? He is in the New Apostolic Reformation movement, okay? And he has been in the New Apostolic Reformation since about 1995, even 1994. He was involved with the Toronto Blessing. Now, for those of you who don't know uh, about Michael Brown, Michael Brown was um, very heavily involved in doing uh, false signs and lying wonders um, where people were falling over and shaking and all kinds of horrendous stuff. He was involved with that and he is still today involved with that. This is not to break through. Something, Something snapped in me a week ago. I'm different. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Would you lift your voices for this generation? God, God, God. Pensacola, 
you were talking about a time of extraordinary spiritual intensity. There's no other way to describe it. Uh, everything happening with such an urgency. Crowds coming from around the world. People getting online 12 hours before the night meeting started. Every day for many, many months just with a hunger to meet with God. People getting saved in the parking lot, waiting online to get into a meeting. They didn't even know why they were coming and yet God met them there. The hunger, the thirst, the, the non-stop activity. My, my ministry schedule at those times was between 80 and 100 hours a week just unrelenting, experiencing God in a deeper, more profound way, just the, the joy of His presence. You feel like you're living in a dream, seeing these things happening. You've prayed for and longed for for so many years, now they're happening in front of your eyes, transform lives, and then people in the school being equipped and sent out the testimonies. At the same time, you're, there's constant attack, there's constant controversy. The, the demonic pressure was hard to describe. I've told people that the highs, spiritually speaking, were like nothing I'd ever known, and the lows, spiritually speaking, were like nothing I'd ever known. Now, if this man really loved the Lord and loved the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us we are to warn an heretic once, we are to warn an heretic twice, and then have absolutely nothing to do with them. Okay, that's what scripture says. Now, this man, on the other hand, <clears throat> is still involved with this Michael Brown person but as you're going to see and I'm going to show you this guy preaches a different gospel also because he is Calvinist now the next thing I'm going to do is I'll leave the link for all of this underneath so you can re listen to it all in context so you know that I'm not just taking bits out of context or whatever but my purpose is to show you Jeff Durbin is on Doreen Virtue and her complete lack of discernment. <laughs> this woman is not discernment ministry. She's just not. She's a false teacher. Okay, so let's come over here. So we are now on ApologiaChurch.com and we're on Meet the Team. Now there is a gentleman um, up here that I'm not going to be talking about, but his name is Luke Pearson. Okay, and here we have Jeff Durbin, we have Zach Morgan, and we have James White. Yeah, the Calvinist James White. Now, Jeff Durbin, I'm just gonna read a little bit about Jeff Durbin, <clears throat> and I'm gonna share, there's some things in here that are very troubling, to be quite honest with you. Okay, so here's what it says. Jeff Durbin is a pastor slash elder of Apologia Church in Tempe since it was founded in February of 2010. He worked for many years as a hospital chaplain. Jeff is a popular speaker for camps, conferences, churches and schools across the nation. He has participated in outreach to various religious organizations nationwide and is even engaged in public debate against atheism. Jeff was featured on a series for the History Channel, quote unquote, The Stone Ages, which he reviewed the Christian approach and philosophy concerning drug and alcohol addiction. Jeff co hosts Apologia Radio and Apologia TV, um, both of which garner followers throughout the US and internationally. Both shows are available at uh, via at apologiastudios.com okay this is really problem problematic jeff is a world champion martial artist with five black belts he starred in popular video games movies and tours he played michelangelo and donatello for the teenage mutant ninja turtle franchise as well as johnny cage in mortal kombat the world tour our younger followers, followers may have even seen him as a fighter in MTV's The Final Foo. Jeff has been married to his bride Candy for over 20 years. They have four children, Sage, Imogen, Sailor and Stellar. Now guys, martial arts is the occult and I'm going to show you this. The floodgates of Eastern mysticism and New Age thought were opened in the West through cinema and literature focused on a generation searching for its identity. With the Cultural Revolution, Woodstock and the Beatles, martial arts, yoga, 
and the introduction of Transcendental Meditation found a growing acceptance among baby boomers. Television shows and films such as David Carradine's Kung Fu, The Green Hornet, Billy Jack, and Bruce Lee's Epic brought the mystical powers of the martial arts into the homes and lives of millions of Americans. And a country, once historically Christian in background and belief, began to flirt with the ideologies of the Far East. And little did we realize the price we would pay for stepping on to this enchanted ground. During the 1970s and 80s, martial arts became mainstream. With the introduction of full contact karate and kickboxing to the public, the martial arts were now being promoted not only as self-defense, but as a sport, as health and fitness, and even as a family activity. Martial arts, Tai Chi, and yoga classes began springing up in YMCAs and health clubs across the U.S. And Hollywood and the printed page brought secrets of the Far East within reach of the imaginations of millions of Americans, while promising them discipline, self-confidence, self-control, and self-esteem. During the 1990s, Chinese masters with their internal arts of Tai Chi, Bagua, Xing Yi, and Qi Gong began publishing books which revealed the methods of attaining these once secret abilities of the martial art legends. And there is now a growing interest in the spiritual powers and practices of these men of the East. Even many celebrities and politicians have revealed their active participation in these and other mystical Eastern arts. Today, the martial arts, seductively blended with metaphysics and psychology, has begun to take on a more scientific facade. Once traditionally secret arts are now being taught as the means to achieve not only personal protection, but self-healing, self-awareness, and emotional regeneration. Self-empowerment has become the god of this age. A web of Eastern philosophy and mysticism is being spread in an ever-increasing attempt to capture the hearts and minds of this last generation. Through Hollywood, the film and entertainment industry is weaving an illusion of the martial arts being both scientific as well as spiritual. And it is this blend of science and spiritism which will prove to be the final omega of apostasy which was foretold by the apostles of Jesus Christ. I put the force into the movies in order to try to awaken a certain kind of spirituality in young people. Uh, more a belief in God than a belief in any particular uh, you know, religious system. I mean, the, the, the real question is to ask the question. Because if you, if you haven't enough interest in the mysteries of life to ask the questions, is, is there a God or is there not a God? Um, uh, that's, that's, for me, the worst thing that can happen. You know, if you ask a young person, is there a God, and they say, I don't know. You know, I, I think you should have an opinion about that. The question must be asked, a belief in what God? Who hath ascended up into heaven, or descended down from above? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name, and what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? And what is this mystery which Lucas and others are spending billions to introduce to the youth of our generation? Let no man deceive you by any means, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. According to the Chinese classic, the Tao Te Ching, the Tao is like a well, used but never used up. It is like the eternal void filled with infinite possibilities. It is hidden but always present. The Tao doesn't take sides. It gives birth both to good and evil. The Tao is called the Great Mother, empty yet inexhaustible. It gives birth to infinite worlds. It is always present within you, and you can use it any way you want. This spiritual energy called the Tao, or universal life force, is symbolized by the mystical figure of the yin and yang. And it is through this merging of light with darkness, these two opposite yet supposedly equal powers, that harmony and the Tao is manifest, and spiritual gifts and abilities are said to be achieved. This description is identical 
to that of the power used by the Jedi and Sith warriors in the Star Wars film series. This very same power is also called by them the Force. And it is this force of light and darkness, of good and evil, which Lucifer claims to be. It is this spirit and power which has been worshipped by every occult and pagan religion since the dawn of time. Albert Pike, the author of Morals and Dogma, states this belief in unmistakable terms. Yes, Lucifer is God, and unfortunately, Adonai, or the Lord Jesus, is also God. For the eternal law is that there is no light without shade, no beauty without ugliness, no white without black. For the absolute can only exist as two gods, darkness being necessary to light. Simply put, pure philosophic religion is the belief in Lucifer, the equal of Adonai. But Lucifer, God of light and God of good, is struggling for humanity against Adonai, the God of darkness and evil. And professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. For if therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness! According to both Asian and occult philosophy, this force or energy is said to dwell within all matter, the rocks, the trees, the planets, animals, and every human being. And although hidden, it is said to be only awaiting to be awakened an awakening which is achieved through the practice of Eastern meditation, breathing techniques, mantra chanting, visualization, hypnosis, and countless other occult practices. It is this spiritual energy which all Eastern religions credit as the true source of their power. Although this mysterious power is called by different names in every culture, its principles and manifestations are always the same. For what is known as Qi by the ancient Chinese is called Qi in the Japanese art of Aikido, while to the Hindu this same power is known as Prana. To the Polynesian people it is called Mana or Mana, energy. And by many New Age practitioners in the West this spiritual power is called Oregon, vibrational or subtle energy. And this same spiritual energy today is being used and promoted by New Age gurus worldwide. To martial artists across the world, the cultivation, control, and demonstration of this energy is considered the highest and most sought after ability. Qi is said to be manifest through harmonizing both positive and negative forces of the universe within the human body. This energy is then demonstrated by martial artists in countless ways stone, brick, or board breaking, iron body exhibitions, performing seemingly impossible feats of acrobatic skill, withstanding extremes of temperature, exhibiting superhuman strength, speed, and explosive power. And this same mysterious energy, which is used by disciples and masters of these combative arts, is also demonstrated by Qigong and Reiki practitioners, by acupuncturists, acupressurists, Tai Chi masters, yoga gurus, and New Age holistic healers. To many this power is called the God Spark, or Cosmic Consciousness. But regardless of its name, this esoteric power is from one and the same source. That old sir- Okay guys, so I've shown you um, what uh, martial arts is all about, is to do with actually with the occult and it, uh, I'm going to leave that video underneath so you guys can see um, what this man has been involved with. So the next thing what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring you over to their doctrine, okay? And um, <coughs> to apology of church doctrine. And what they say about the scripture is fine. Um, then they go into the sovereignty of God. Now... When we think of sovereignty, we think of that God is is over everything and He's all powerful. He's in, you know, He's ahead of everything. But they they change the meaning of this word sovereignty. Okay, now 
It says this, this is what he says, We believe in one true and eternal God, unchanging, unchangeable. We believe God is the creator of all that exists in heaven and earth. That God who is described in the Bible is unique. He is unlike anyone or anything else in the entire universe. God is all power, all knowledge, all wisdom, and is due all glory, honor, and praise. All, all that comes to pass does so at the the decree of God. And this is what they do, is what they do is they take the word sovereignty and they say, well, whatever happens is the decree of God. Now, I've discussed about this, I think, in my last video, whereby they will say, if a child is raped, that is the decree of God, and that will bring glory to God. Okay, or if someone is abused, that brings glory to God, and God decreed that to happen. In other words, God decided that would be that would happen and god made that happen okay and continues on all things will in the end result in in the glory of god so then we go over to god's deity okay now that's fine they talk about the trinity there but here's the problem the god's plan of redemption we believe that man was created in the image of God. Man rebelled against his creator and fell into sin. Okay, so that's fine. As a result, man became spiritually dead, totally unwilling and indeed incapable of seeking after God. That's not true. When we're born, we're given, we're given a conscience. We know what's right and we know what's wrong. And well, God, before basically when, when Calvinism came, the the early fathers believed in free will, okay? And it was because of um, Augustine, the monk, that brought about this uh, belief system that you can't actually decide, that you're so dead that you can't respond. So let's continue anyway. Um, and indeed incapable of seeking after God. God from eternity past, having foreordained all things, joined a certain people to Christ Jesus, that he might redeem them from their sin, and in doing so bring glory to himself. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died in the place of his elect people. Now, before we go on, when he says, yes, it does talk about the elect in the scripture. However, the Bible also says that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It also says, those who seek me shall find me when they seek me with all of their hearts. Okay, now, what he's basically saying is that God created the elect. Okay, so he created us because he knew us, but the rest he created to go to hell. I discussed this in my last video, but that's what they believe, okay? Um, so that he might redeem them from their sin, and in doing so, bring glory to himself. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died in the place of his elect people, providing full and complete forgiveness of sins by his death upon the, the cross of Calvary. No other work can provide for forgiveness of sins, and no addition can be made to the completed and finished work of Christ. That, brethren, is a false gospel, okay? he He's added on to the scripture. He's added on to the gospel. And the Bible says, if they preach a different gospel, let them be accursed, let them be anathema. The gospel is very simple. Jesus Christ died on the cross, was buried, rose on the third day. If you If you believe that and confess with your heart that you believe all of that, the Bible says you will be saved. Now, you must believe that Jesus rose from the dead, okay, on the third day, and that he died according to the scriptures, and that he rose on the third day according to the scriptures, okay? Now, when Jesus was on the cross, he shed his precious blood to cleanse us from our sin, and if, if we repent, which means to change your mind and trust on the finished work of the cross, you shall be saved. And that's for every man. That's the plan of salvation for every man. God does not create certain babies to go to hell and create certain people to only be saved. Now, the, the Lord is sovereign. He knows what's going to happen, but he does give us free will in the midst of it all. Okay, so here we have salvation. 
This is what he teaches. We believe that God in his sovereign grace and mercy regenerates sinful men by the power of the Holy Spirit, not by any action of their own, bringing them to a new life. God grants to them the gifts of faith and repentance, which he then exercises by believing in Christ, turning from their sins in love for God, turning from their sins. That's wrong. When we get saved, we don't turn from sin. We put our trust in the finished work of the cross because Jesus Christ died for all of our sin. Now, when we are saved, we still have the sinful flesh. Okay, our, our flesh is still sinful, but our spirit has been saved. So to ask the flesh to turn away from sin, yes, what we do is we read the precious word of God and we walk with the Lord, but we still sin every day because we're in this flesh. The only time we're going to be perfect is when we die and get our glorified body. And then and only then we will not sin ever again. Now, I want to just clarify this, that when we are saved, we are justified, which means that when we stand before Christ, we are completely covered in the blood of Christ. Okay, we look, we have, we're, we're standing in white robes, we, we're justified before God. We are sanctified positionally by God. We have been sanctified by what Jesus did on the cross, by the blood of Christ. Okay, and we go through a continual sanctification process. The Bible talks about this, where we're continually being sanctified daily, okay? And this is what we do every day. We get up and we submit ourselves unto the Lord, okay? And that happens every day. And as a result of our salvation, there will be good deeds. Not not because we don't get saved because of our good deeds. We are saved unto good deeds, okay? So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you something that is absolutely outrageous. So I've shown you that uh, Jeff Durbin um, has been involved with occultic stuff as far as um, martial arts is concerned. And now I'm going to bring you over to my country in Ireland. And I'm going to let you listen to this man talk. And please forgive me if I get really angry because this angers me so much what you're about to hear. Okay, so let's just listen to this man, okay? Remember this guy is a Calvinist and he's also involved with something occultic. Do I believe this man is saved? No, I don't, brethren. I'm going to be really honest. No, I don't. Let's let's play this. Hey, I'm in Dublin, Ireland right now at the Guinness storehouse, the Guinness factory. So much history. Okay, just so you guys know, back in 1996, 95 to 1997, I worked very close there in Basin Lane as a teacher and I worked with little children and um, poor children that had alcoholic fathers and drug addicts because of this. This is why it makes me so mad. I had a precious little boy in my class. I won't call him his real name. I'll call him John. He was only a little boy and his father would come in and he would be drunk. Okay, having had the stout, as they call it in Ireland, and uh, gotten drunk in, in the middle of the day at half twelve. And this poor little boy was terrified of his father because he was always drunk. Ireland has got a bad reputation for drink, and rightly so. But let's listen to what this, may God forgive me for it, what this foolish man says. Let's continue. Here in all of Ireland, really, but in Dublin, you can see the remnants of this old Christian civilization. It's impossible to escape from it. You see the churches, the buildings, the businesses created by Christians who were forward thinking. They uh, they were all completely future oriented. I mean, as a matter of fact, in Christian civilizations, you can see that often they would build uh, their churches, and it would take four or five hundred years to build a church. I mean, they would pass the labor and the dream down to the next generation, knowing that it was their great, 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 great grandchildren that were actually going to end up worshiping in this completed thing. And uh, Brother, and I just want to say something. If the people that are saved are the ecclesia, and we are the called out ones, we're not in a building, okay? Now, I know we meet in buildings, okay? But that is not the actual church. Okay, Jesus is the cornerstone and we are the living 
am. We are the living bricks of God, the living stones, okay, and we are the Ecclesia. So let's continue on. Behind me here is uh, the Guinness Storehouse. It's uh, where Arthur Guinness began his business. And it's a really interesting story, actually. Arthur Guinness was a believer in Jesus Christ. He loved God. No, no way. Not in a million years. He was not a, a believer in Christ. No believer in Christ would build something like this, like a brewery, to bring around drunkenness and pain and agony into human beings' lives. No, he wasn't. This is utter nonsense. Let's continue, brethren. On. He believed in the gospel, and um, the underclass in Ireland at the time was being uh, devastated by hard liquor. Uh, gin was a problem. Uh, all the hard liquor was destroying the underclass, and so Arthur Guinness wanted to create something that would be ultimately good for people, uh, that would be difficult to really abuse in the same way as a hard liquor. And oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, um, Jeff. You, you know, this this is just irritating me. St stout is just as bad. I know of particular men who drank a lot of stout and came home and beat their kids. After going to Mass, they'd go for their stout or their Guinness and they'd come home and beat their kids. So this is utter nonsense. Let's continue, brethren. I'm getting annoyed. <laughs> I just, I'm righteously angry at this. Let's continue. And so he created a Guinness as a means to essentially bless the underclass, create something amazing, and uh, he did it. It's the remnants of this legacy stand behind me. And what's amazing is just how forward-thinking Christians were at the time, building civilizations, leaving legacy. So leaving a legacy of drink, alcohol, and drunkenness. You, Christians did that. No they didn't. If you were a true Christian in those times, you were against anything to do with that according to the scripture. No drunkard shall inherit the kingdom of God. These <sighs> for generations deep. Uh, Arthur Guinness, when he uh, was given a hundred dollar um, a uh, gift in, in a will of his godfather he invested that money into a business and he signed a nine thousand year lease a nine thousand year lease uh for about 45 dollars a year and so okay just so you know brethren because drunkenness got so bad in ireland you guys call it a liquor store we call it off license but I'm going to say liquor store for the sake of the American people because a lot of Americans listen. The liquor store here used to open up until half 11 at night where you could go to the liquor store and get, and get alcohol. But it actually got so bad that people were dying from alcohol poisoning, um, from drunkenness, Guinness, all kinds of drunk, drinking, drunk, um, all kinds of drink. And uh, they actually started to close it down at half past 10 at night. 10 30 in the evening because it got so bad and actually they started putting ads on the television in ireland to warn people about drinking it got so bad okay alcoholism here in ireland is a huge gigantic problem we have a very dark cold winter our climate is cold so many people just go to um go to the pub to socialize or they get drunk and before I came to know the Lord in 1988, that is what I did. I went to the bars, I drank Guinness, I, you know, I actually used to drink Guinness and Black Orange and I got drunk off that. So what this man is saying is utter nonsense. Let's continue, brethren. Oh, that's still all around me uh, to this day. And what's amazing is just the mindset of Christians in history. You see, again, in Ireland, the remnants of an old Christian civilization. Christians who were forward-thinking, they were future-oriented. They thought about the future. They thought about next generation. They thought about um, the legacy they were leaving for their grandchildren. And so they built and they labored. 
they weren't thinking the way that we do now today in the West as evangelical Christians. They weren't thinking about just the next two years or three years or five years, uh, hoping that at any moment we would be whisked away and um, Jesus would return. And, and they were thinking in terms of nine thousand years away. They were trying to establish a gospel culture, a culture that was centered around Jesus and the biblical worldview. And when they built, they built in terms of nine thousand years into the future. Okay, I think that's enough. I'll leave the link underneath, but I want to explain something to you, brethren. <laughs> I'm an Irish woman, and when I was being brought up in Ireland, it wasn't Christian at all. It was Roman Catholic. <sighs> man, this this irritates me no end. This man is showing his complete ignorance. And the fact that he claims to know and love Jesus Christ and talk about this, the way he's talking, is just ignorant beyond belief. I grew up in Ireland and growing up in Ireland, I went to a Roman Catholic school. Um, uh, a lot of a lot of the priests used to drink alcohol and get drunk and smoke their cigars. Um, this business of, oh yeah, we're looking at 9,000 years to bring Christianity <laughs> through drunkenness or through the, bu the, the brewery uh, that Arthur Guinness founded. I tell you, the amount of people that, okay, they still go and visit the brewery in Dublin, but it brought nothing but pain and agony to little children. Children who were were beaten up by their fathers, who were who were alcoholics, who were sexually abused by their fathers or their mothers or whatever because of drunkenness. And this just irritates me. And this is the type of man that Doreen Virtue has on her show. And if this doesn't shout at you, I don't know what will, brethren. You know, I'm, I'm saying this because I love people and I don't want you to get caught up with Doreen Virtue. She's allowing this type of nonsense onto her um, channel and she, where, when she herself is a false teacher. So brethren, this is all I have for you at the moment. I pray that this has blessed your heart I pray that this has opened your eyes to Jeff Durbin and Doreen Virtue and that you now know that Doreen Virtue is dangerous. So that's all I have you at the moment and as, as I always say, may the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you and may the Lord let his light to shine upon you and I'll talk to you super soon. Bye for now. Bye bye.